Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a belated frontline update for the 28th of February 2023, sort of referring to the activity that went on yesterday. Uh, just a personal update I fractured my elbow just because, like, honestly, bit of advice if your feet ever decide not to move, don't have your body continue moving. I just, both of those things need to be in a concordance with each other. Because otherwise, you know, you fall over and you fracture your elbow. Anyway, is uh, thank you so much for uh, kind words for everyone. But you know, it's not really too much of a problem at the end of the day. Uh, things are a lot worse for people on the front line in Ukraine. And to there, we will return. So there's been not huge amounts of activity in the and do excuse me, I'm trying to do this with my left hand, and that's crazy. Uh, uh, not too much activity from Kupiansk down to. Uh, down to Kremlin. There is activity around Kremlin. Let's just have a look uh, very quickly at what the ISW says. So the Ukrainian general staff reported on February 27th that Russian forces deployed 200 conscript recruits from Rostov Oblast to Luhansk Oblast on an unspecified day. This is a kind of dribs and drabs re reconstituting the front lines of the Russian forces that I don't think is particularly useful. They really need to have like a big old battalion tactical group or a couple of them, like ready to do a big punch with mechanized decent mechanized equipment and well-trained troops to do a big of, uh, offensive we are don't seem to be seeing this there are different sort of rumors hanging around about whether the russians are getting ready for a big uh, attack there there some some ukrainian sources have been saying that but i just don't see it uh, I, I don't see it at all. Ukrainian Luhansk Oblast head Serhi Haidai stated on February 27th that Russian forces have escalated operations in the Svatova Kremlin and Belarivka directions in recent weeks. I don't think that's the last week. I, I might, that might be in recent weeks since like the beginning of the so-called offensives. But I don't think that that's the case at the moment around Svatova. I think Kremlin, it, it is difficult and there are some uh, there are anecdotal evidence that things are really tough in and around Kremlin, constant barrages from MLRS and uh, artillery. Uh, it goes on down here to say geolocated footage suggests that Russian, Russian forces have likely pushed Ukrainian forces west of the R66 near Pishane and Chavona Pivka. Uh, a, a Kremlin affiliated mill blogger claimed that Russian forces along the Svatova Kremlin Belarusia Lysychansk line have adopted a new approach to make gradual advances, which is consistent with the reports of a new Russian manoeuvre element that can only advance at the pace of dismounted infantry and whose attacks will culminate quickly before securing significant gains. In other words, it's really slow for them because they appear to be operating at the speed of their slowest soldier. And that could explain why there's been no movement on the front lines really anywhere around the Svatova uh, area down to Kremlin. There's a little bit to be said about this area around Dvorichna. Uh, no reports pro-Ukrainian blogger said, or uh, source says there are rumours that Russian troops north of Dvorichna are trying to cross the Oskil River. So far, I have no confirmation. And I would also consider that a stupid choice. If you manage to cross the river at all, you have to gain a foothold in a much lower area uh, that the AFU overlooks. Uh, the other problem there being that in that if you do cross a river, then you're backed against a river and it, it's quite difficult if you're put under pressure from the west. You've got nowhere to go, really, uh, other than back in the river. So it is that that's difficult area maybe for the Russians to make gains in. They need some serious river crossing equipment, so on and so forth. Uh, we are going to pop down to the Kremlin area um, not too much else said from no reports in that respect, um, but we are going to uh, have a look at a few other sources. Let me try and get my uh, map in the right place. So Defmon here says the Ukrainians have repulsed attacks in the area of Novoselivska, Stelmakivka, Poschanka, Nevska. Uh, even if there's not a lot of progress from day to day in this area, he says the Russians have managed to push the airfield back in some areas in the last couple of months. I've not seen any movement on deep state mapping, uh, but it could be that there is a little bit of edging to the west uh, up around here, more likely down really in the uh, Poschanka area. So on my map, that would be further down in this area just to the north of Kremina. 
uh, where we have Chavona Papivka and Ploschanka. A uh, bit of movement there, but over the last couple of days, I wouldn't say that there's. I've heard of anything uh, significant at all. And then if we come down to the Kremlin area, as according to Def Mon Pro Ukrainian sources, so Ukrainians have repulsed attacks in the area of Bilirivka, Spirna, Boristova, and Vyumka. 154th, 10th, and 80th Brigade are doing a great job holding the Russians back in this area and he goes on to say a russian mod mentioned the ukraine is being hit close to dobrova this probably means the front line has not moved much uh southwest of kremina now before i go on i just want to mention a couple of things i i i made reference to the idea that there's a big attack coming from the russians russia is ready for a massive attack on ukraine as early as friday but is postponing it says the head of mikhaili regional military administration vitaly kim um, he called on Ukrainians to be ready for anything. The Russians are technically ready to strike. For certain reasons, the Russians tolerate the blows, but they are still preparing for it and preparing more intensively, conducting re reconnaissance and changing tactics, he said. I, I just don't know. I mean, they would need some serious material that I don't think that we've seen, uh, but maybe they're accumulating that somewhere. But you can rest assured that if they're accumulating troops and, and material in significant numbers to be able to achieve something meaningful with an offensive the ukrainians would know where it was because they've got real-time uh satellite imagery and, and in intelligence being fed to them at 24 uh, 7. i'm going to go through kenneth gregg so swedish soldier who's been fighting in ukraine he's he gives his opinions on uh, of the front lines here and it's always interesting reading what he says but i always do take it with a pinch of salt. He's not always on the on the front line where he's talking about. And sometimes, you know, you wonder how verifiable the claims are. But anyway, some thoughts about our upcoming major offensive. But at first, Kupiansk, there are so-called tactical battles going on here with both sides trying to figure out who's stronger and who can launch a more serious attack. Kremina, the enemy sent their VDV troops, so their airborne troops, to attack, but unexpectedly encountered our airborne troops, airborne versus airborne. And... This is something that, that I've heard from a number of places that actually fighting is tough in Kremlin, partly because they've got better troops fighting against better troops. Ours were better, says uh, Kenneth Gregg. There are lots of videos showing burnt out equipment owned by the enemy, as well as a video of ours going through their positions. Overall, however, the situation is unchanged, even the enemy's uh, failures. And then he goes on to Bakhmut. I assumed we would leave Bakhmut two weeks ago, but we are still there. So I will not assume anything more about Bakhmut other than to report what is currently happening. This is a lot of people are saying this. A lot of people are really surprised at how Bakhmut is still uh, still holding. Uh, it's quite an achievement. North of Bakhmut at Bekivka, the enemy is advancing with a spearhead towards uh, bon uh, Bodanivka. They are now about six kilometers from the village. The tactic is to reach Chesivyar from the north, from the south they are stopped, and thus put uh, into effect the encirclement of Bakhmut. I would actually say from the south there, the, Ukraine, the Russians have made some advances over the last 24 hours. The strategy is good, but there are, are their resources sufficient. It is considerable distance to advance, and it is getting wet. The blowing up of the dam yesterday gives them no other options. There are some claims that the dam hasn't been blown up. Someone like Defmon says, I'm not too sure about that, not really seen any evidence. Um... But uh, I, I guess we'll see. Vukladar has received enemy reinforcements, but they are being thinned out almost as fast as they are arriving. Kind of what I was talking with those 200 conscripts going to the Svatova area. Uh, straight into the minefields they go, and when they turn back, our artillery takes over. And so to the news of our upcoming major offensive. Here we, talk, we should ask ourselves two questions. What is the scale and scope of the offensive? I can't tell you anything I know on this subject, so let me say what our general staff has announced. Quote, during this year, we'll retake Mariupol. Uh, already that will end the war quickly he says uh, and two are there enough troops and material so what he's basically s seems to be hinting is that that there's going to be an attack towards the south towards mariupol are there enough troops and material here i cannot reveal more than what has been made known before which is this now and, and this is what i find interesting and wanted to share with you 20 new brigades have been formed and they include all types of weapons. Home Guard troops have resumed training and now also with heavy weapons. Previously, HG was a light infantry unit, but now we have uh, even have tanks. We have been repairing and servicing our heavy weapons all winter and they are now getting ready for action. I talked about this, how 
places like Czechia are fixing up uh, damaged tanks, captured tanks, and other older tanks from the Eastern Europe that are being upgraded. These are being filtered back into into units that are getting ready to for for the offensive, at least according to Kenneth Gregg here. And I, I think that, that there is something in this, and I don't know whether it's my bias, my pro-Ukrainian bias, that wants there to be this really amazing kind of offensive capability of the Ukrainians ready to, to do their thing. But actually it does make a lot of sense that they are reconstituting, they're taking their time to make sure everything's right, rather than say by this date you have to take Donbass or whatever it is that that... Putin has supposedly said here it's like right when we are ready and the time is right we will strike and we are going to build up all of this equipment um so we've been repairing and servicing our heavy weapons all winter and they are now getting ready for action shipments of new heavy weapons from the west which have already started to arrive uh, then one must also consider the enemy they have about 370,000 heads in our area and their reserves for the reserve are already being eaten up they have not started any new mobilization either. Their maintenance is being attacked every day, even in Mariupol itself. The depots in Belgorod, for example, will certainly certainly be knocked out a few days before we launch our major attack. Wow. Uh, then the most important thing of all, the combat morale. There we are light years ahead of the enemy. Uh, and he goes on. Uh, so that is, I think, fascinating. A fascinating insight if it is accurate, of course, is that at all accurate? Okay, let's go to Bakhmut. So before we go to Bakhmut, I think this is quite an interesting map from New World Economics War Reports, which shows you, and indeed, this is even worse now. So the, the Russians have advanced to something like that, and down here they've advanced near to this black line. So the black lines are the main supply routes that have been compromised and are not uh, really a, a able to be effectively used. And the Turquoise line there is one that uh, remains. And indeed, I think there might even be an even uh, more interesting one here, as far as I'm concerned. These are all the routes into Bakhmut, again from New World Economics War Reports. Map of Bakhmut from uh, Thetty Mapping. So Thetty Mapping is another mapper uh, online. Sometimes I refer to his work. Uh, highlighting the back roads and minor paths left in control of Ukrainian forces. Some have said that a retreat is no longer possible, and I disagree. The heavy equipment will have a hard time, but the manpower has a number of paths to escape. So it, it, although you might say, OK, there's only this one uh, turquoise route out of there, back to Chazib Yard, there are other ways of, of getting to that route or, or, or getting out there indeed. Um, and you can see them there. So that that's uh, quite a useful graphic, I think. Uh, no report said, I've not received any info confirmation of the counteroffensive. Sorry, if you remember, I talked about a possible counteroffensive in Bakhmut that was looking to cut off the Russians who had over advanced was, was the claim. Uh, but it doesn't appear to have happened, or at least if it did happen, it was it was reversed. You know, it didn't get anywhere particularly. What is currently happening is that the Ukrainians are under intense artillery fire in what has been described as, quote, the heaviest shelling in a long time time as far as flooding is concerned and the counteroffensive so defmon pro ukrainian source says no evidence of the counteroffensive taking place but also talks about the flooding there's a lot of talk about the airfield blowing a dam northwest of bakhmut i do not believe it has been done or if it was done it had little to no effect flooding would be detected as darker areas in the area of the red square images january the 30th and 27th and i guess you know there you go so he, he would suggest that there should be more dark in that red square and there isn't. So he, either it didn't happen or it had not the required effect. Uh, and then here, uh, Global War Monitor says, Ukraine are 4.2 kilometers away from being encircled. Well, let's go and have a look at this in potential encirclement. And you will see in in some of the places I've left the Ukrainian lines to show you just quite how much the Russians have advanced. I did move my Ukrainian lines back in the east and the south here. So the, that's not the case there, but they have moved there as well. Let's go to this northern area. And you can see this is broadly according to Syriac maps. Uh, so this is a pro-Russian mapper. But you can see the advances toward Bodanivka and towards cutting off this main supply route that, that's coming in from the west. Uh, they they have stalled somewhat directly north. There's a bit of advancing in this very sort of north 
eastern uh, section there, if I can uh, press the right buttons. Um, just over there, they've taken a few blocks. Let's see if I can expand on that. Uh, so there, there's a bit of movement there, but really it's all about the north. Or is it? Because uh, actually I'm going to contradict myself because there's a lot of movement in the south as well. The net does seem to be closing on Bakhmut. The east here, they have the Russians have taken over most of the blocks up to the river. I mean, they're really now advanced. Basically, I, I don't know whether effectively the um, Ukrainians have pulled back behind the river and done some kind of opera operational withdrawal or whether they are still fighting hard for these eastern suburbs. No report said yesterday that they were still fighting hard for them, but it, it looks like they are, are, are on a losing uh, wicket there. And then down south, there's movement uh, for the Russians all around here. They've, they've made some move um, towards the very southeastern suburbs, even to the east of Ivaniska. Um, and to the south of Ivaniska, you can see they've made some advances in the uh, on the fields just south of Ivaniska. So they are again getting close to interdicting this line. But it's almost like the interdiction of this main supply route is kind of irrelevant if they can kind of take it in the southeastern suburbs here. So I expect there to be a big push from the Russians there, I would think, over the next, well, going on right now. And then further gains towards Stupochki and indeed south of Chesiv Yar. Uh, so really, uh, and and uh, points down south near Kudimivka and Ozerinivka. So really, the, the Russians are making gains pretty much everywhere around Bakhmut. And the question is, is it still worth the Ukrainians holding out there? If the, the claims are correct from the Ukrainians that they are expending the Russian um, personnel at a rate of seven to one, and again, is that accurate? Uh, then that calculation is very much in favour of Ukraine staying there as long as it is safe to do so. It is all about uh, evacuation routes. So if they can safely get out of there, uh, then they will remain there. But in, until it, until the moment it's not safe to get out, or you know just before it's not safe to get out, they will, you know they'll they will stay in Bakhmut for as long as as they can. Um. Uh, and then we we come on down. I don't know. There's too much more to say. In fact, we're going to see what ISW has to say. If there's anything that they can add, just so confirming all the stuff I said. A lot of getting closer to the center from the east, uh, basically uh, making gains everywhere. Um, but this is interesting from Igor Gherkin, former Russian officer and prominent critical mill blogger. Igor Gherkin remarked on February the 27th that the current Russian assaults on Bakhmut are useless and will exhaust Russian troops without taking strategically significant ground. Again, that it, I think that's true. Um, but they, if, if they want to take the Donbass, they have to take at least Bakhmut. I mean, they, they can't just leave Bakhmut. So they, they do have to take it. It's whether the way that they are going about this is the most efficient use of troops and material. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. It, I was lying in bed last night um, after getting back from the hospital. And this is what I was thinking about. I was thinking, and this is just probably stupid thoughts, but I, I was thinking, goodness, if, if you take all the troops that they've lost in Bakhmut, Right, and you 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 recruited them over the time, but you didn't commit them. All the all the all those who have died and been injured, you recruit, you have them, you store them up, and then you have everyone there at once, and then and then attack Bakhmut in one wave of just a mass of people. Then I'm sure that they would have had more success and lost fewer troops than just feeding them into this meat grinder over a, a you know six month period or whatever it's been. Just there, there is something to be said for Pyrrhic victories like that, but just like human wave attacks. But just you've got to have such a critical number of them that that the defenders just there's no way they could defend that that many people. I mean, since they have committed that many people over time in some kind of chronic long term thing, it would have made a lot more sense to just yeah use all those people, but use them in one one big offensive at once. Um, anyway, that's just my uh, ridiculous thinking, but there you go. The Suryat maps, territorial games for the Russians are shown here. So this is north near Yehidni, 
uh, and this is down south near Ivnivska, um, pushing both to the east and to the west there, um, and then claiming that they are that the Ukrainian army has been withdrawing its forces from eastern Bakhmut. Further claims of, of territory gained in the north near Yahidni as well, uh, so on and so forth, and in the east and in the south. So lots and lots of territory gained as according to, to Syriac maps. Uh, right, let's go to Avdivka. So we'll come out of Bakhmut and have a look, uh, have a quick look at Avdivka. Although I just want to add the last thing, as I always do, from this is from Rebar Pro Russian source. Evacuation of the wounded is hampered in this in back in Bakhmut by a lack of supply routes and a shortage of vehicles. In addition, it is simply impossible to remove much of the equipment of the 93rd Mechanized Brigade from the Ivanivska area since almost all of the ARVs, those are armoured recovery vehicles, were destroyed or damaged. Uh, I've not seen evidence of that, but it could be the case. And they're saying that the 93rd AFU Brigade suffered huge losses and is being remanned with reservists. There's a documentary on the 93rd. It's called 93rd. There's a three-part documentary. It's on YouTube. Go and check it out, and that'll give you an indication of the work that they've been doing since 2014 in the war. So we zoom up to this area, Novobakhmutivka, just north of Abdivka there. This is where the Russians are claiming there is advance for the Russian forces, We'll go to rebar the pro-Russian source saying over the past few days, the Russian forces have expanded the control zone at Novobakhmativka in the Avdivka sector, moving in the direction of Novokalinova and Alexandra Pill. Um, so the different spelling and, and possibly pronunciation of these in Russian and Ukrainian. But they these two settlements here, they are moving from Novobakhmativka towards those two. Uh, in the south, Russian units established control over an important hill east of Krasnorivka. So Krasnorivka is here and east of, of Krasnorivka, which is, which is where they've made some gains sort of to the west of this road coming down. Um, uh, and it can, uh, they continue improving the tactical position before storming Ukrainian positions in the village. The liberation of Krasnohirivka will allow expanding the bridgehead north of the Avdivka fortified area. At the same time, ammunition was supplied to Avdivka itself and the personnel of infantry units were rotated. Additional firing points for large caliber machine guns were installed. Positional battles continue south of Avdivka in Pervomysky. At the moment, the advance has stalled. Both sides are holding the previously occupied lines without going on the offensive. Okay, so that is to say that uh, fighting is is going well for the Russians, or at least better for the Russians in the northern area, has stalled somewhat in the south. It's always been slow going down there. There have been gains over the last week towards, well, f through Vodjanie, this long, thin uh, settlement that then s that skirts above these water uh, features and is north of Povomysky. If they can, if they can circle try and encircle Povomysky both north and south that will help them a lot but uh, Novelsky just down here is a stick in the mud for them and they are struggling to get past there to allow them that greater encirclement uh, but then we come on down to uh, pass another Krasnohorivka down to Marienka now there are some claims that the Russians have made some advances in a westerly direction in Marienka Pro-Ukrainian source Noel reports says south of Marienka, Russian troops make attempts to reach Pobieda. So they are now a bit closer to the village, but this is, does not provide a strategic advantage. The area east of Pobieda has often changed hands. No changes in, in Marienka, fighting mainly in the northeast. So he, here you've got that, again, the long settlement of Marienka, where they are, the Russians are making some gains in the north near some agricultural warehouses and piggeries and then in the south as well in some of the suburbs down there and towards Pobjeda. Uh, just to put that on my map that's this northern salient uh, and an attempt at, at breaking through the Ukrainian lines near Pobjeda there to get that encirclement but they have been having success uh, down in the southern uh, area just they've you know breached the Drisby Avenue to the south uh, this is avenue that comes right the way through the center of Marienka, although you know, the whole place is pretty much rubble now. Um, 
Rebar, pro-Russian sources, South American AFU forces reinforced the positions in Pobieda. Three Cossack armored vehicles with personnel were transferred to the village. Machine gun operators were stationed at heights and approaches to strong points are controlled from copters, so helicopters. Anyway, uh, as we move on to Vukodar, uh, we'll see what No Reports has to say. With regard to Vukodar, says i mean he's you know reports have produced a bunch of compilation videos just showing the the amount of destruction that is taking place this one is an interesting one that is doing the round so this is a video of um of an apc or an ifv that takes three mine hits it's still going after the first mine hit takes another one i mean it might be atgm but i think most people are saying mines um and then, like, although it's a rocket that's firing towards it, it looks like it is a remotely detonated one. Uh, and it keeps going. And then, you know, third time lucky takes that third hit. Just quite incredible. But, um, yeah, so that one's doing the rounds. But the, I, I find this fairly enlightening. This is from... Chris O'Wiki often has some uh, good stuff. So leaked documents have shed new light on the relationship between the Russian Ministry of Defense and the Wagner Group. The MOD is reportedly blaming Wagner for a shortage of shells that may have contributed to Russians' recent disaster at Vukladar. So saying, look, to the Wagner, you've used up all our shells in the Bakhmut area and it hasn't really done much. And we couldn't then, then use all these shells to support the troops attacking in Vukladar and therefore it's, it's your fault. Uh, the VCCHK OGPU Telegram channel has published a set of logistics orders likely leaked as part of the ongoing war of words between the Russian MD and Wagner. The latter's head, Yegevni Prigozhin, has recently been complaining about a shell famine. I've told you lots about that. According to the channel, Wagner's supply of ammunition is carried out solely on the basis of relevant written orders from the Chief of General Staff and Deputy Defence Minister for Logistics. The distribution channel is described as follows. Blah, 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 blah. It says that Wagner is being blamed uh, for not only the entire mobilisation resource from among the convict population, but also the ammunition resource and provided a shell hunger in the armed forces, which are said to be uh, suffering across the entire front line. A source has told the channel that, quote, there was a catastrophic shortage of shells in the 155th Marine Brigade of the, of the Pacific Fleet. Um, in the absence of proper support, the Marines perform tasks that are unusual for their purpose in the Vukodar direction at the cost of significant manpower losses. So when you start seeing a blame game, you know something's gone wrong. Something has definitely gone wrong in Vukodar. We've seen repeated video evidence of huge numbers of uh, pieces of equipment being blown up there, troops uh, getting taken out, and now the blame game has started where the Russian MOD is having a go at Wagner for causing a shell shortage that has meant the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade did not have uh, artillery support when attacking, and that's why they got done in in the Vukladar area. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on Vukladar. So this is from ISW. Geolocated footage posted on the 25th and 6th shows that Russian forces made minor advances in an unspecified date directly south of Vukladar. Russian mill bloggers continued to discuss intense positional battles in the Vukladar area, with one source claiming that Russian naval infantry elements are fighting toward Vukladar from Mikilska, just southeast of Vukladar. A former DNR militia spokesman, who was reportedly recently dismissed from his post, visited the Vukladar area on the 26th and noted that it is important for Russian forces to defend against Ukrainian counterattacks in this area because Ukraine wants to cut Russian supply routes to occupy Crimea. This I would definitely agree with. Uh, Ukrainian Tavirsk Defense Group spokesperson Colonel uh, Dmitryskivsky uh, noted that the pace of Russian operations in the Vukladar area has overall decreased over the past four days due to poor weather and noted that Russian forces only conducted 17 ground attacks near Vukladar on February the 27th. It still seems like quite a lot to me. In the Zaporizhia and Kherson areas, there have been claims of 100 instances of artillery attacks from the Russians, so they must have enough shells around here to continue doing at least some artillery work. Uh, and there's a lot of defences being built up, particularly in Crimea and in the southern sort of Kherson and Zaporizhia areas. There have been some satellite imagery uh, of lots of activity taking place in that regard 
And in fact, the ISW reports um, the Ukrainian general staff reported on 26th that the Russian forces are increasing efforts to build defences in Crimea and have transported 150 personnel from Chelyabinsk Oblast to perform engineering work in Crimea. Satellite imagery dated 25th shows that Russian forces recently established trenches and roadblocks along the M17 and M2202 highways approaching Armiansk from the north west so that is uh, around here so there is l there are lots of defenses being built if you think how long they've had to build them now since they started retreating from Kherson or blast they've had time to really build up some significant defenses that will at least slow the ukrainians down given any counteroffensive that they might decide to do anyway that's enough from me. This, uh, please like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate all the support for the channel that you give. Really, really amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I will hopefully speak to you a little bit later for the extra video if I have time. See you later.